Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to start this panel discussion. We will continue the discussion that took place during plenary that ended half an hour ago. We're going to talk about modern cities, conducive environment, and comfortable city as a driver of urban economy. Before I give the floor to each of our panelists, and each and everyone will make a short presentation, I will first ask all of them the same question. So please, friends, if you could give a very brief answer of just 20 to 30 seconds. And so as each and everyone could contemplate, I want to ask you to write your answer down on those little cards. So my question is, if we're talking about a modern city as an engine of economy, a driver of economy, what should it be? I understand there are many parameters. A lot has been already said. But what do you think, as experts, what comes first for a city like that? Please give one or two things that you think are most important. And please indicate your names so that when I read it out, I understand whose card it is. So we're making an experiment. Because very often, speakers influence one another. And when the first speaker sets the framework, he kind of orients the discussion. But I think this will be a more frank experiment. And I will read it out and ask colleagues to comment. Thank you very much. So, dear friends, I think it was a success. All answers differ. Rustam Nagalevich, you mentioned that a city should be clean and comfortable. Could you very briefly comment on that? Why do you think that matters most? Because this is the first impression you get when you come to a new city. Either a city is clean or not. And then there's this infrastructure. A city should be comfortable in terms of transportation, in terms of all facilities. It should be comfortable for city dwellers. Thank you. Marat Husnulian, you mentioned, you, you wrote comfortable. Well, this is the main topic of our today's forum. Comfort, in a very broad sense of the word, is the most important factor. A city should be convenient for people. People should enjoy living in a city or visiting it as guests. And we do our utmost to make Moscow a comfortable city. Indeed, we are talking about comfortable cities as drivers of economy. But if, if you were to identify split comfort into different parameters, I will definitely do that when I make my presentation. I'm planning to do that. Vladimir Vladimirovich, you mentioned safe. You said safe. Well, a city should be safe. A city can be cozy, it can be beautiful, it can be comfortable. But if I don't feel that it's safe for my children. I don't think I will choose to live there. So safety comes first. And I mean safety in a very broad sense of the word, because I don't mean just mean crime. I also mean safety on roads. I mean high quality of social services, 
be that health care or, or everything else. So when I feel protected in a city, when I feel safe, that's what matters most to me. There are different criteria that matter. But if I don't feel safe, if I don't feel protected, I, do not, I will not be willing to build my future in a city. Maxim, I felt you'd mention young people. So you said young people are the engine and a city should be dynamic. Well, you said from the economic point of view. And in the today's world, young people are the driver of growth. So we need to make sure young people don't leave cities, they don't migrate. We need to create good centers for education. And this will create dynamism. And people will tolerate, I think, certain drawbacks if they see evolution, if they see that it's coming. So this dynamic, the change, is more important than the actual achievement. We need to show that there is change happening. Gil, your answer is very close to what Maxim said. Maxim wrote about young people, and you said is how the city treats all groups of citizens. And you also mentioned equity, uh, rise of assets. Could you comment on that? We should evaluate cities is by how do we treat the most vulnerable people. And the most vulnerable people in cities usually are the children, the elderly people, as well as the people that are poor the people that have disabilities, the people that have come from some ethnicities or racial or even women in many parts of the world. So it's not by how many billionaires we have or how many companies, but how do we treat the most vulnerable people in our cities? It's about equity. Thank you. Now over to you, Vinny. You wrote, make together beautiful public buildings and spaces, which is very broad and very beautiful. Could you comment on that? I think public spaces are the most valuable element that we have. We can share, we can be together, and we can comment and have self-critique. We can be inclusive and we can have everybody on the same uh, place. But in order to do that, we, uh, I would like to add the word beauty. And beauty is uh, a word which we have to share what that can be. Beauty is indeed about inclusiveness. Beauty is about fantastic green. Beauty is about dynamism, as you say. And beauty is also about being proud. And in the end, I think this kind of collective pride makes uh, the city incredibly strong. Thank you very much, dear friends. Now I will ask questions to our panelists, something relevant to their field of expertise. When we talk about urban development, we need to achieve a number of goals, increase life expectancy, create comfortable urban environment, create 50% of high-tech jobs, which are unlikely to be created in rural areas. So all of that is linked and connected to urban development. We have a national project for the development of urban environment, spatial development strategies. So my first question goes to Vladimir Yakushev. The national project provides for improving quality of urban environment by 30%. But if you ask people in this room what that actually means, we will get a number of options. So what indicators are there and why 30%? Why does the quality of urban environment have to be increased by 30%, not 25 and 35? And how the attainment of this goal could impact the economy of our country? When this national project was drafted based on the decree number 264 of the Russian president, 
that speaks about the need to improve the quality of urban environment by 30 percent and reduce the number of cities with unfavorable urban environment by half, a lot of, a lot of discussion took place, not only within government, but at all expert fora. We discussed it at length with experts because we needed to understand what it is we mean by the quality of urban discussion. When we first started the discussion, we understood it as in a very narrow way. Urban environment back then meant uh, creating public spaces, renovating in the yards of cities, and only that. So at first we thought, how about we use the federal resources that are allocated for a specific territory and use this as indicator. So money comes first, indicators come second, and then we draw conclusions and see who spent money efficiently and who didn't. After we debated this question at length, we came to a different conclusion. We figured out that the index, quality of urban environment, should not reflect just indicators of one single federal project for the improvement of the quality of urban environment. The index should reflect all national federal projects that will be implemented in a specific municipality. And this municipality should benefit from this multiplier effect that result in all federal projects that will be implemented throughout six years. So we have a matrix that comprises 36 indicators, not just renovation of urban spaces, but also it covers transport infrastructure development, including municipal transport, that includes social infrastructure, safety. I mentioned already as I was responding your first question. So this matrix of 36 indicators gives us an idea of what a specific municipality should be like today. So if we sum up all these indicators over six years and if we get over 50% of the amount, total amount for a municipality would say that the environment in this municipality is favorable. If it's below 50%, then it's non-favorable. So we'll start collecting data in 2019. I think it will be a complicated endeavor, especially in the early years of the program. I think there'll be a lot of arguing because I imagine all municipalities will strive to achieve good results in this ranking, but that was exactly the thinking behind the project to make regional and municipal authorities create synergies, multiply effect of all federal projects that are implemented in a specific city or territory. And then I'm sure this index will demonstrate the efficiency of municipal or regional authorities, whether they really try to achieve the result we're talking about. And this positive impact must be felt by every dweller of a specific municipality. So this is how we came up with this indicator. On the one hand, it's rather complicated, but if we look, if we analyze it, each of the 36 indicators, they're transparent, they're easy to understand, and authorities will have will get clear guidance on where they, on what they need to focus on in a particular moment in time. Another important thing, important indicator I wanted to highlight, it has to do with the federal project, urban environment, is engagement, citizens' engagement and participation. And it's an important indicator because by 2024, in order to improve quality of urban environment in a specific municipality, local authorities will have to make sure that at least 30% of residents voting 
and above should participate in decision making. So our cities need to change and we need to do that with respect to people's opinions. So this indicator will be applied in all cases and it will show people's opinion on change that's happening in cities and make them involved, bring them on board. This was the rationale and this is how we're going to structure it. So 36 indicators, does that mean that all federal projects and their outcomes will be integrated in the 36 indicators? Could you mention something that you think is the most interesting or the most challenging? Which indicator will be the most difficult to achieve? If we're talking about indicators that oh, those 36 indicators, like I said, almost all of the, oh, by the way, environment is also among the 36. So there are methodologies to collect statistics of federal executive authorities that are focal points for these or that indicator. Uh, there are some that are truly interesting, the ones we discussed a lot, because at first some people were skeptical, but as we analyzed those indicators, as we asked many experts for their opinion, as we polled city dwellers, we decided to keep those indicators. For instance, a number of pictures taken in favorite places of common people in the streets. Because this constitutes public assessment. And it shows us which sites are loved by locals. Because this is where we take pictures. Either it's a beautiful place, either it's a place with some special history, so it's important. So this is what we debated most, I think. But we decided to keep those indicators. And it's now included in the decree by government. And it will be up to citizens. Because the administration can ask people to take pictures in beautiful places. And this can be influenced. This has been mentioned. But on the other hand, Unless you like your city, you're, you'll hardly take pictures and publish them online. We'll look at we will look at different things as well. We'll look at number of road accidents in a municipality, which is a sad, sad indicator. So it ranges from road accidents to number of photographs. So it's a very comprehensive matrix and it will give us a comprehensive overview of the situation in municipalities. And municipalities differ throughout Russia. It is indeed a very broad range. Yeah. Bringing citizens on board will probably be difficult as well. I have a question to Marat Husnulin. An incredible transformation has been happening in Moscow. Sergei Sabanin made a presentation in the morning and he spoke about how subway is going to grow to fold and how new links will be built in the city. I live at Polizhaevsk and now it only takes me 20 minutes to get to Sheremetyevo airport, which was unthinkable a few years back. So I understand that large projects are being implemented in terms of transport infrastructure as it's changing the face of the city, but is it changing the economy of the city as well? Has Moscow become more appealing for investors? Are you improving SMEs uh, conditions or are we only creating opportunities for large corporations? Could you please comment? Thank you. Um, and as a host, I would like to say thank you very much to everyone who have attended our forum. And on a separate note, uh, thank you very much to Vladimir, because this is the time when we have the national projects and everybody's thinking how can we go about uh, implementing these national projects. We have 
two public sessions, so one in the city of Kazan, to develop uh, housing construction and the good urban environment. And all the decisions which had been approved by the Russian president have been issued as a legislation, which is unprecedented. The huge uh, work has been done by the ministry, by the governors, by the uh, government uh, to create prerequisites for solving all these issues. So I'd like to express um, now my gratitude to uh, tourist Amnar Kalish, to uh, the governors who have attended. I myself uh, came out of Tatarstan. I've learned a lot. And Maxima also would like to extend my appreciation to you. I know that he, he and I have been working together in the government. Now he is developing the region of Perm. And thanks uh, to all of our guests. Um, Although you are very busy, but still you've taken time to come and join us here. And this is a confirmation that all the mega policies of the world, all cities and the countries of the world are thinking what can be done to, uh, to uh, enhance human capital. And, uh, and the human capital is the key, key component of any success. It's a ninth consecutive year of us uh, holding this uh, urban forum. And I can clearly uh, witness a trend. While previously we've been speaking about the uh, quantitative things, how many meters, how many kilometers we have to build, but now every urban forum we are speaking about the quality of life. And um, I would like to, could you please show my presentation? Here in Moscow we have identified some key comfort indicators which we are using. Uh, previous slide, please. What has to be done? to make sure that the Moscow is more uh, convenient uh, to live in. First of all, is the uh, transport access. Next, comfortable housing with the good um, yards. Then, then self-sustained and sufficient um, neighborhoods. Uh, the preschool and school facility close ho to the home. The health, um, culture, recreation, and the attraction points is, of course, creating new jobs and uh, improving uh, improving public amenities, providing amenities. And I can give you some examples of not only related to Moscow, but every city uh, preparing for the Moscow Urban Forum, uh, they've been doing research. For example, this year, we and the BCG Boston Consulting Group have done a research. Um, we've been working with McKinsey and PricewaterhouseCoopers. They've been doing the urban research of how Moscow stands in comparison with other megapolises. Where are we better? Where are we doing not so good? But we can clearly see that the more the city invests uh, in people, in comfortable environment, uh, the more we get back the better is a return. I would like to give you some numbers. We have the big uh, facilities construction program. And everybody who came from the region will say, hey, you have uh, this kind of insane amounts of money. Of course you are building. Of course you are investing. But these numbers that you can see on the slide, we've identified the targeted investment program worth of 2 trillion Russian rubles. It means 600 new venues and facilities, where 70% is invested in the transportation infrastructure. Why transportation? Well, because transportation for Moscow is the key development factor. And um, whenever we invest one ruble into transportation, we get three rubles of the out of the budget investments in return. The more we invest in transportation, the more private investments we get, the more comfortable it is to be in the city, the better is business development. And Vladimir, you are absolutely right that we have the development of the small and medium business, uh, the 20 um, percent annually people make more money. The more comfortable is the city, the more businesses we have, and the more money we have to continue uh, continue improvements in Moscow. Another another uh, figure I would like to give you. Could you please go back to the previous slide? According to the federal law number 214, in the city of Moscow, there is a one trillion seven hundred million Russian rubles have been invested by the Russian population into the housing. And people say, oh, it's dangerous to buy apartments, to buy houses in completed projects. Yes, we are in a tough transition period. But the, but the population entrusted this public program. They've trusted their 1.7 trillion rubles. Um, uh, buying apartments and housing. It's a 30% of all the money in Moscow. It's a level of trust to the um, government. Speaking about infrastructure, we developed the whole bunch of projects. We believe that we have to, uh, we have to do them in the transportation canvas. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
No, no, no. The show me the one where slide number four. We set a goal that the that the Moscow Metro has to be doubled in capacity. Next revolutionary task is uh, railways to increase capacity by 100 percent, and the next one is to tie up together metro, uh, transportation, interchange hub, and automotive lanes. And thanks to that, we have, uh, by the 2023, we'll have the biggest number of railways in the Moscow in the world. It will be the best transportation system in the world. I'm not afraid to say we have been moving towards it for eight years, and all the numbers you, that you see here is being either designed or being built right now. And the mayor has already been speaking about the about the rings, about the metro. I will not be repeating himself, but I would like to say one thing. For example, um, uh, developing the, the street network. It's a road network development. We have set a goal. Even though the cars, private vehicles, you know, the more roads we build, the more cars we have on driving in them. But still, we go about building the roads, and in eight years, we built 800 kilometers of the roads. 350 artificial, you know, construct structures. In the next four years, we'll build another 500 kilometers of the automotive roads, because we do understand its soul will have impact on the better quality of light. This, this lateral, um, uh, lateral link that you, that you can see is basically makes this kind of like a four square maybe which has really changed already changed the situation because here on the map what is the solid line is being has has been built what is the dot line which is being built and it changes the transportation flows in the city the next thing i would like to draw your attention to is that all of this is great but let's go back to the issue of quality Previously, we did not uh, quite realize how important it is to build Rush Moscow River embankments. We have developed a new program for the Moscow River embankment, and before 2023, all 200 kilometers of the Moscow River will be improved. It's a colossal work because we need to do it for the city residents. Next is the renovation program. When we first began to do it, we just wanted to to really or improve living conditions of one million people. But when we began to study this issue, we realized that without transportation, without um, car parks, without uh, improving programs, won't be able to do it. And now the renovation program is the one strong driver of uh, the whole city development. We lifted the bar in Moscow development. And the next, uh, next uh, topic, and I'll be finishing up, what we also do is we uh, develop socially oriented projects, so we build sport facilities, social facilities, and next is the program of healthcare. We are going to build one million square meters worth of the medical facilities and centers. And all the projects um, uh, are part of the mega projects, of the key projects, which we believe as the most viable and important. And here on the slide, you can see the most important projects. And what we've seen that by implementing mega projects, now we were able to reach every district. The mayor has improved the, the My District program. And we are working with all 142 districts or regions of Moscow. We are looking into it, what can be done, what has to be done for the people in Moscow to feel better about living in the city. And simple numbers. Last slide, please. And this is the economy driver. When we um, summed up all of our um, all of our revenues from the urban projects, we got this amount: 364 billion rubles. We get taxes from the from the construction industry. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's huge. Having created um, workplaces, having created working conditions, we are going to get taxes for the next uh, 10 years: 360 billion rubles a year. And the contribution of construction is almost 70% of the total economic activity. We start with 5% back in 2010. 11% of all the of all the jobs are created by construction industry. Again, I will say the more we invest in people, in human capital, in the uh, urban environment imp um, improvement, the, the better is synergetic effect. The better is Moscow. Thank you.
Marat, a short question for you. Moscow has achieved uh, so many things, renovation, constructions, investments. And um, if you look around, you can see a lot of changes. And the changes are quite impressive. But what is the biggest challenge in Moscow right now? What is a Moscow's challenge? Like one or two, the most important ones that they have to deal with. The most important challenge is to integrate the whole transportation network in one project. Metro, railway, automotive cars, uh, interchange hubs, embankments, uh, pedestrian zones. We want to make it a single transportation network. That's uh, our biggest challenge. And when we'll do it, will be number one. Yes. Thank you. Great. It's a great, it's a great idea. It's a great goal. Uh, Rustam Nurgaliyevich, uh, uh, Mr. Governor of uh, Tatarstan, I'll have a similar question to, for you. Could you please um, add, um, add uh, some, some aspects about the Republic of Tatarstan, Russia? You have a great cities, uh, very attractive for the, for the living. You have uh, great exhibition areas. You have uh, some new modern spaces enabling people to live comfort comfortably, to work comfortably. Your Innopolis uh, innovation hub really struck me. I've used the uh, autonomous taxi for the first time in Innopolis. It's really amazing. Well, the self-driving tra okay, train is okay, but the self-driving taxi is a little bit more scary. Just how important for you is the call of uh, of uh, building comfort for ensuring a subsequent economic growth because the goal by itself or creating a comfortable environment in the city is huge. But uh, do you pursue this goal and to what extent your city is becoming a locomotives and drivers of the economic growth in Republic of Tatarstan? First of all, I have to say that we always have to have some big challenges uh, in front of us. One of the biggest challenges back in 2005, when we celebrated 1,000 years anniversary of the city of Kazan, it all started with Kazan. It was the first uh, step when the city began to uh, shape up differently. And this would be the program of uh, getting rid of the obsolete housing, building the transportation infrastructure. The second step for us, and the big challenge at the same time for us, is when we were awarded the right to hold a university game back in 2013 and celebrating 1,000 years anniversary of the city and university aid. Myself and Marat Husnulin, we had been working together, and they have gi had given us quite a big uh, impetus and push forward in terms of uh, changing our capital. Uh, sport facilities, hospitality facilities, transport facilities, all of this has been renovated. But when the university game in 2013 had been completed, there was an emptiness, a vacuum. What do we do next? Uh, what something, it felt like something was missing. So we uh, looked at different cities, how did they change in Moscow, of course. And these uh, public spaces, and these systemic uh, solutions for different challenges in, in the Russian cities and uh, districts. After that, we had launched a program for building public spaces. We have to make sure that our people do not leave our cities, do not migrate away. We have to understand that the city of Kazan has to be comfortable, has to be hospitable. And I have to say that um, I would visit Moscow several times, and uh, I've seen Moscow. We've invited Natalia Fishman to come join work for us, and these competencies, step by step, in five years, all over the Republic of Tatarstan, we've created 328 facilities. It's a systemic approach. Of course, it was difficult to make first steps. We did not have um, the proper professionals. Now we're holding different forms. We invite a lot of um, our foreign partners, and we do a lot of consultancies, and we are seeing changes. And this uh, involves many people into this uh, transformation project. In the time being, we were able to form the cohort of the young people thinking differently. And secondly, we've learned how to work with people because we also did not have this competence before. And 
you have to build all of this. And it takes some elements uh, for public spaces which uh, were not there before. And now we have we have a lot of small businesses and companies who are functioning not only within Tatarstan but also outside of Tatarstan are building different infrastructure. So we get new competences. And after all these spaces um, come around, business is coming. We have new opportunities uh, to create things. And our municipalities have to understand that this is not only about just building something and forgetting about this. You have to run these facilities. You have to do some creative stuff, culture events, you know, you know, sport events and stuff. All of this process is interesting. And uh, like our ministry has mentioned, the quality of life is, be it a 36 or whatever, Maybe maybe in Moscow it's easier to evaluate the situation by 36 points. But I believe that there are many subjective things uh, in evaluating any region. Anyway, we have to do this uh, estimation to be more efficient in the future. So it is about creating new, uh, new preconditions on people. That is to keep your people. What do people want? People want a good city to live in. People want a good culture, community centers, facility. They want high paying jobs because we see how many of our best, best students, they move away from our place to Moscow, they move away to St. Petersburg. I'm not saying that they should not do this, but as long as they come back to us. And we, every year we organize our younger generation studying in different uh, cities and even outside of Russia. We have to keep connections with them. And like you said, now, this Innopolis innovative uh, location, we have a university. It's a modern city where we are building such an IT uh, center for our country. We have a lot of different other plans. So we always um, try to learn the new things. Wherever we go, we try to identify some learning points, something that we can bring back, something we can implement. Thank you. and. Uh, What is the what is the advantage? What is the spirit of Tatarstan? We have very tasty food. The food is just great in Tatarstan. And we have beautiful girls. Well, nice. Uh, and uh, I've tasted. You've tasted what? The, the food or the beautiful girls? It's just, I'm wondering. Thank you, Rustam. And um, friends, uh, we are moving on to um, to our foreign colleagues and guests. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to Gil, Gil Penelosa. Gil has an extensive experience. He's a founder of uh, 880 projects. Very interesting of how to build such an urban environment, which would be very comfortable for those who are eight and those who are 80. He's um, he's promoting very genius idea. Yes, now we have a lot of cities, which uh, which are zeroing in on the park zones, on uh, some public spaces. For example, in London, there is a project Healthy Streets, is very very indicative. If you look at the parameters of these projects, indeed, it's it's about healthy streets. It's a street that you want to walk. It's a street where you don't have a lot of. Uh, fumes and pollution and the uh, exhaust. And on one hand, you have a public transportation. Uh, on the um, other hand, you have a chance to uh, to enjoy yourself as a pedestrian. You can stop by. You can you can drop into cafeteria and stuff. It's a very powerful trend. And Gil will share with us his experience. By the way, in Bogota, they built about 200 par parks. Um, where they had not been existing before. And now I'll kindly ask Gil to deliver his presentation. And I'll tell you um, beforehand that Gil has a lot of slides, but all of these slides are very interesting. His deck is really great. So focus, uh, listen attentively, and uh, follow him as he will be presenting. Gil, the floor is yours. You. Thank you. Let's imagine. Let's think about this. Half of the homes that we'll have around in 40 years, 
do not exist today. Half of the homes. And that's in 40 years. Today we got about 3.5 billion people living in cities. Within the lifetime of our children, we're going to go to 7 billion people. And this is a fantastic opportunity if we do it right, but also a huge responsibility, because whatever we do or don't do is where billions of people are going to live for hundreds of years. So if we, this is going to happen in the next 40. Let's see what we've done in the last 40. Unfortunately, in the last 40, most of the cities that we've done around the world are really horrible. We've been segregating, sending the poor people to the worst places, separating rich and poor. We've been focusing on cars, 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 and not on people's happiness, and even mobility. This is how we've been trying to solve mobility, and we haven't even solved mobility, investing all of this. None of the cities in the world have solved mobility through their private car, none. So. In the future, we got to improve the cities that we have today, and we got to create cities radically different, very different what we have done in the past. Six ideas. The first one, streets for people. The streets are public space. They belong to everybody. When we look at our cities from Moscow or any city from the air, 25 to 40 percent of the city are streets. The streets are the largest public space anywhere are more than the parks and the uh, schools and the libraries and everything com combined. And they can have different uses. Like now I live in Canada, in Toronto, but before I was commissioner in Bogota. And I took a small program of a few kilometers and a few thousand people, and we turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. Sunday mornings, we pop it up, and people come out. 121 kilometers all over the city. And this can be done in Moscow and in Kazan and everywhere in the world. You got the streets. All you got to do is open streets to people, close them to cars, and the magic happens. In Bogota, we get 1.7 million people out every single Sunday of the year. One out of four citizens come out every Sunday. And the important thing is that it changes minds. All of a sudden, it reminds us that the streets are public space. They belong to everybody, everybody. And cities like Los Angeles and New York and Paris and Delhi and so many cities, all of, this has become like a positive virus. It's also so nice because we meet each other as equals. The wealthiest person in the city and the poorest cities and their families meet at equals. Second, let's create 80 cities. 80 cities, let's think, what if everything that we did in Moscow, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, the library, the park, the school, the building, everything had to be great for an 8 and an 80-year-old. Not 8 to 80, 8 and 80 as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the 8 and it's good for the 80, it's going to be good for everybody. From 0 to over 100, we must stop building cities as if everybody was 30 years old and athletic. And let's build great cities for all. That is the concept of 880 cities. Simple but powerful. Third, walking. Nothing as important in a city as walking. Of course, sustainable mobility is also walking, riding bicycles, new uses of cars. But walking, every single trip begins and ends by walking. We walk. That's how we were created. Just like the birds fly or the fish swim, people, we walk. We walk. And we need to make it safe. And today, it is not safe. Today, every day, yesterday, people driving cars killed 741 people walking. That's more than a person every two minutes. That is not civilized. A few months ago, two planes crashed and everybody died, and all of the Boeing 737 were grounded. All of them. Well, every single day, the equivalent of five of those planes are the people walking that are killed by people driving. We need to make it safe. They are not accidents because they can be avoided, they are incidents. So we need to make our cities that are safe. If we're going to prove walking, it has to be a priority. This is not a priority when we do sidewalks like this or when we allow the cars to park on the sidewalks. Or even worse, when we don't even do sidewalks. We need to improve the way we do cities for everybody. And this is totally due. This has to be a top priority. And of course, riding bicycles. You know, Moscow could be as good as Copenhagen or better. Not only have the best public transit system, but the best bicycle system. 
in Copenhagen. It's cold in the winter. It's hot in the summer. But nevertheless, it rains all year round, and 41% of the trips are done by car, by bicycle. 41. And now they want to go to 50%. And any city in Russia could be like this. You know, when you do bicycle infrastructure, if it's not safe for an 80-year-old and for an 80, it's nothing. It's nothing. Don't even call it a bikeway. It's nothing. If we're going to improve public transit, one of my brothers, the mayor of Bogota, he said the civilized city is not the one where the poor have cars. It's the one where the rich use public transit. We got to have quality public transit for everybody, and we got to have connectivity and frequency. And people say, where are we going to put public transit? Well, let's do the mobility math. Do we want one of this or 140 of those? Do we want one of this or 145 of the others? It's very clear that walking and cycling and public transit takes us a lot less space than cars. And now people talk about the driverless cars. Well, you know, and people do very nice drawings and say, with driverless cars, we're not going to have congestion. As if the congestion was the driver. It's the car. If we don't change, if we don't change our behavior, you know, we're going to have the same congestions or actually more. So the reality is that it can be great or it can be horrible. It really depends up to us. Sidewalks, nothing as important as the sidewalks. And we don't realize that we have people that are blind, people that are on wheelchairs, people that have all kinds of disabilities, and we don't make them a priority. When the reality is that we allow cars on the sidewalks, we put barriers on the sidewalks, all over the world, we, nothing as important as the sidewalk. And we got to work. Why the sidewalks? Because sidewalk, you know, on the, on the street, we go from point A to point B, on bicycles, on cars. On sidewalks, no, on sidewalks, that's where we meet boyfriends and we meet girlfriends. And we meet the person, the neighbors and the person that sells flowers and fruits and vegetables and coffee. We use sidewalks in the summer and in the winter, and the kids catch Pokemons, and we catch buses. There is nothing as important as city as a sidewalk. That's where we develop a sense of belonging. That's where we meet as equals. It reminds us that walking is much more than walking. We go to Buenos Aires, and people dance tango on the sidewalks. Sorry, the click is not moving fast enough. Five, let's do parks for people. I've been in Tatarstan where you're doing fantastic parks. Again, a good park is not the one that wins the sign awards. A good park is the one where people visit, stay, and come back. It's about people, the parks, and the public spaces. And the parks and the streets and other public places remind us that mobility and public spaces are two sides of the same coin. So let's think of the 8 and the 80, the children. Imagine in Moscow, everywhere having playability. On the sidewalks, we have swings. We are waiting for the bus, and you have a small park. You know, it's not about the money. It's about having a little bit of creativity and putting a little bit of color and thinking about the happiness. We see how happy these kids are. And it's not only because it's fun and games. It's because when children play, they learn. That's how children learn, by playing. They develop their muscle strength, their cognitive thinking, the coordination, the friendship, the sociability. These are going to be our future city builders. So we're going to have a park or a play area within 500 meters in the next four years everywhere. Every single kid in Russia is going to have a park. And it's going to be great, not only for the children, but the grandparents. I'm talking about grandparents who are living longer, not longer, much, much longer. And older people are gardening and having ice cream. And you know, if you think you have a lot of older people, over 65 in Russia are going to double. The over 80 are going to quadruple. And it could be nice and fun and exciting. People are not even thinking about retirement. It's about every engagement. The biggest waste of resource we have are the olders. People retire and we cross them out as if they had died. Except that they got 20, 30, 40 years left. And people have knowledge and people have experience. You know, in Moscow, the life expectancy has doubled. Has doubled in the last 150 years. We have learned how to survive. But with all of these issues of climate change and public health crisis and traffic congestion, we got to learn how to live. 
and a lot of learning how to live is about the built environment. So the last message is about equity. We should evaluate cities is by how do we treat the most vulnerable citizens. And they are the children and the elderly. And of course, if people are poor, if people have disabilities, if people are racial minorities or ethnic minorities or people are women in many countries. So, or if people are old, we gotta work on all our most vulnerable. These are, I'm not just going to say, these are not technical issues or financial. This is about policy. And I'm not talking about political parties, but about values. Everybody needs to participate. And most cities are talking about these issues. Most are talking. But we're going to move from talking to doing. And the reality is that cities say, oh, we're doing. Yes. But we got to do more. And we got to do it faster. Thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Wow. I, I thought it's impossible. 154 slides, 10 minutes. Uh -huh. You did it. When I first saw that his presentation was 154 slides, I even tried to rehearse it. And I was thinking, that will give him at least 15 minutes, but he managed to do that in nine and a half minutes, which is a new record. I'm sure you will agree. And it was beautifully done. It was a very clear presentation. I have a little question to ask you. What would Moscow competitive advantages be from the point of view of comfort? Because every city is different, and some can boast its geographic location or history or something else. So this is what you work on. So what would make Moscow the best in the world? Two or three points. Worked in over 400 different cities all over the world, in every continent. I think something that is really important is that Moscow is good, but when you are good, sometimes people become reluctant to change. I mean, if Moscow wants to compare itself with cities that are worst, in 10 minutes you can do a list of a thousand cities. But if you compare yourself with cities that are worst, eventually you're going to look like those. No, I love that the deputy mayor says we're going to have the best public transit system in the world. Okay, you also need to have the best park system, the best neighborhood parks, the best big parks, the most walkability, the best happiness, the best quality of life for children, the best quality of life for elderly. So benchmark with the best in each one of the categories, and then we're going to move forward. So I, I would say that, that not to be complacent, but continue to have a process of continuous improvement. Thank you. Maxim, I have a question to ask you. You as governor, as governor of Perm region, I think many people know that you have created very good environment for the young people. You said that young people are the engine of economy, and you managed to keep young IT experts in Perm, although they could find jobs all over the world. Many people speak fluent English, and the world is transparent for them borders are transparent for them, but you still manage to keep them, although your budget is much smaller than that of Moscow. So you have somehow managed to create an environment that they think is comfortable. So could you share your experience? Which programs are the most efficient and which of them create this comfortable environment for the young people that will create our future? Well, I wouldn't say that we've achieved all of our goals. We're just moving in this direction. I wouldn't say that no one is leaving. And I don't think it would make a lot of sense to set this as goal, zero migration. But we want people to, if they go, to come back. So we want to start projects that would make people come back to their home regions. Marat Husnulin showed a very good slide which lists all the main elements. 
We in Perm do have certain resources, not as much as they do in Moscow, but in the past. We had a problem, we're lacking dynamic, we were losing pace and we are restoring it back now. Maybe our policy was less consistent than that in Tatarstan, that we're building pace for 15 years. So for now, for us, it's important to show that there's positive dynamic. And we need to show that we're making those baby steps, slow but steady. We understand we need to develop our transportation, so we have a large project to develop the transportation system. We're placing railroad with tram line that will serve, uh, that will take the function of subway. We're building transportation hubs, but if we start a large construction, that would take two or three years of preparation. So now we are at the project design stage. And it's, it's, it's hard job. But we need to show to the people that we are working, that we are moving in that direction. So we try to combine long-term projects that will have impact in the long run with short-term projects that have immediate results, so low-hanging fruit and high-hanging fruit. And so far, it's been so good. We've launched uh, a project to improve the quality of urban environment. A federal project is in place that allocates money and we are sponsoring refurbishment of an embankment or the central square. The first stage has already been commissioned. More works will be commissioned this year. And we're learning from Moscow, because Moscow started with targeted projects and then shifted towards a more comprehensive approach. So we'll look at everything. We'll look at how houses look. We'll look at lighting. We'll look at renovation of Soviet legacy and Komsomolsky Avenue. And sometimes what you lack can become a point of growth. We have the lowest number of shopping malls in the city. So we started construction of two large shopping malls in the recent years, and we've collected the best experience. So it's going to be huge, 150,000 visitors each. So one is already work in progress. The other one, the construction will begin shortly. So we spoke about young people. What is important for them? They need to feel involved. They need to feel part of a larger, more global context. So this year, I hope we will finish reconstruction of our airport. And in September, we'll have direct flights to Europe. And it's important for people. They don't want to commute through Moscow. Also, we want to support our center of competence, IT center of competence and we'll be providing subsidies to regional, for regional travels. So we're very close to Moscow, we're just a two hour flight away from Moscow and that allows people to do business trips to Moscow. Talking about transformation that's happening in the city. Any city must move, it must change. The city used to be covered with advertising billboards. We've cleaned the city. We procured new buses. And this change, as it happens gradually, it reshapes the environment. It creates new quality of life. And new construction should be happening in the city because it also creates this feeling of development. But all of that is important. But it serves one purpose. It builds trust. It builds confidence of people. And when people trust authorities, when young people see that change is truly happening, that authorities are transparent, are open. I mean, everyone makes mistakes. Only those that do nothing don't. But the fact that authorities recognize their mistakes and are ready to try and remedy makes a difference. One of the colleagues mentioned that clean, cities should be clean, and that's important. 
And I agree with him because it's a sign of respect. It's a sign of trust between people and authorities. And without this trust, nothing's going to work. So those little things really matter. When people sense it, they trust authorities. And when they do, they are ready to be patient because they trust the city, they have confidence in the city. And as for everything else, we have a lot of IT projects, we have a lot of um, uh, companies, and it's important for people to have faith, um, I mean those people who are working, to have faith in their own region. This is our goal. Thank you. Maxim, you've been speaking about the trust, about the openness of the um, public uh, officials, and that indicator that Vladimir has been speaking about, that is involvement of uh, citizen into uh, into urban agenda. Do you know how to involve the young people into this? Are you on the level of uh, 2024 compared to other regions? Or well, we have a lot of methodology of communication with uh, our young people, with people in general, with different uh, age groups. We have we have a website manage together. It's uh, like a reincarnation, basically. It's a Moscow initiative and development, we've adapted it to our region. Now 870,000 unique users and 70,000 registered users we have in this web portal. So the penetration is very high. And with this web portal, we can discuss um, all kinds of projects. We have the complaint section and requests. It's one of our best practices. Yes, I believe that this is a right way to go. And I would agree with uh, uh, with Rustam Mininkanov that, yes, all the changes, they can be only a theory. But the fact is, it's better to have um, some changes, and we have to discuss it. We have to measure it up against the rea reality, to have a reality check. But here we are fully confident that this dialogue we have with the federal government, with the Ministry of Construction of Russia, it enables us uh, to keep going. We do trust these indicators because we know that these are real indicators. Thank you. And dear colleagues, we have the final presentation, and I would love, like to give the floor to you. Oh, Winnie Moss. Winnie is the, one of the co-founder of the MVRDV um, Dutch uh, studio. He's a principal architect and urbanist, and we know that the high-quality urban environment um, cannot uh, exist without the good quality of housing. The standards have changed of not only of not only the space as such, the space we live in, but also for the public areas and public zones in the city. It's important where your house is located. You've heard uh, that uh, there is a Red 7 project in Moscow. is a very unconventional new one, which is setting the new uh, standards of quality. So Winnie, I would like to discuss with you right now of uh, what should be modern housing? What should be the properties of the modern housing? And how expectations have changed for the modern house? How do we take into account interests of different stakeholders? Actually, the Guild has been saying that the a city has uh, has to be fitting for any type of a person, for any human needs. How do we take it all in account altogether in modern urbanism? Uh, please, Winnie, the floor is yours. It is not a question, I guess, but it's simple, like a, like a to preempt your speech, the presentation is yours. Thank you very much for, um, I will try to open the PowerPoint. Um, we are here together to talk about the potential of um, architecture and urbanism for your uh, economic development of the city. If I look now to, um, back to the cities that we have made, then you can see that these cities have a certain objective, but are they exciting? Are they beautiful? If I come now as a client, a young couple, and I want to have a house, they all look the same. I cannot choose in that way. And at this very moment, we face a generation that has, that's more, maybe more clever, that has studied, that has more access, that, that wants to talk, that, wants, that knows what I want, and take, I think, and a lot of energy into the city give space for that variety. So how to do that in that way? Because these uh, new lifestyles that people want to have, 
by living in the city that leads indeed to new expenditure, new jobs, new kind of jobs, new economies, that leads also to new ways of organizing ourselves or yourself, and that leads to new ways of talking, of interaction, of communication on the street, in our bars, and in our cities. It is about, say, your question was about how can I accommodate that? How can I facilitate that generation by using two words, the unused areas of the city and the be complementary to what you have now? I will give you today three examples on three levels, a report from outside. One is on architecture, the second one is on urbanism, and the third one is on landscape architecture. Let's start with architecture. Architecture can help you in making your cities a little bit more uh, better. In that way, I show you the market hall in Rotterdam. Who knows Rotterdam? Rotterdam is nothing. It's a small town somewhere in Europe. And I think uh, but you can use it to, to enlarge what you can do. The market hall uses housing, basically. It makes this kind of arch of lower middle class housing that spans over a space where people come together where they can shop by food of every kind of nature and every kind of species that is there, of every kind of background, hope to be inclusive as much, in every, vegetarian or not, and where you can sit and eat on top of it and have this overview that is over the market. This market is made by, of course, this people that trade, but also facilitated by the housing on top. Behind this giant painting, people live, look at the market, Real estate help to make in that way a kind of address in the city. Yes, you can sleep next to the market uh, uh, and it becomes like a painting of your, of your bedroom. You can work or cook next to it uh, in this place. And yes, you can look at it from any place into, into of your house. Yes, you can have even walk over the market and you can, your kids can play looking down 30, 40 meters to the market activities and you share together not only that field, but also this exchange between the market and the city. That is what this arch is doing, not more, not less. Hoping to invite you to come. And what happened? People somehow liked it, because it's for so many people. They, play the, they have their marriages there. They, the marathon is now part of it, and it became in the newspapers as a kind of, ah, Rotterdam is also there. In the end, also the Lonely Planet is taking care of Rotterdam in that way. It took a while and it helped to invite you all for that. Second example, urbanism. What can we do to make a city better and to get rid of this kind of, with all the excuse, this traffic spaces that we have been making in that way? I mean, Marat, you did a good job on the public transport, but I would like to, to see also that you would work on the streets. It's about intimacy, what we try to do in, uh, in Bordeaux, in order to, uh, to get to talk with people. This is Bordeaux, that is the, the new side of Bordeaux. And Bordeaux looks like this, it's cute. It has beautiful roofs everywhere where you want to meet. It has cute streets, it has a, bri a bridge, and then you see on the left side, you see UNESCO, and on the right side, you see emptiness in that way, history, and you see small villages that are in it. What can we make over there on those places to be incorporated and inclusive? And we start to work on all the traces of the past. Every building loves the past and builds on top of it. And then you get a, and you surround it with small streets, six meters, eight meters wide. So that, and then you have this kind of leftover pieces. And what you get is like a, a public space. It's cute, beautiful, and everywhere. It looks a bit like this in the end. And yes, you can hang out. It's safe because speed is very low. Only 20 kilometers an hour is doing it. And then I put the tram in between and I start to build on the plots with different, with 150 architects at this moment. Ah, no, this is too high. They said, yeah, 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 I know. You have to cut the, the roofs to give light uh, to, the, to the street so that you can walk there and have sun on the places that you want. You want also shadow, I'm aware. And then we make it to the context, we adapt it, we talk with people, and gradually you have this kind of European update, made by these 130 architects now together, covered with photovoltaic cells to be independent of gas and oil in that way, and then how every plot reacts to that. I start, I cut, I cut it more, I adapt clearly to these climatic zones and have this beautiful landscape of uh, streets, cute streets, 
and roofs that are there. And every building becomes a sculpture as such. So here the model on the K, how it is uh, presented and talked with, the, uh, with everybody about that. And then I take you to the street of it. How you walk now in the nearby future to this kind of su series of surprises. Nothing is the same. Everything corner is different because of the ecology, because of the, the sun and the shadow is there. And how we start to work with architects now. How they make their buildings on top of each other and next to each other and how they make this collection as such. And that leads at this very moment, as we speak, on that border to a kind of cuteness everywhere. Yes, you can walk very soon next year into my streets and talk with each other and be cute and close to each other, is what this wants to be. I end with landscape, with Seoul. And Seoul is a, uh, is a very grey, say, city as such, a, a while ago. And it was full with infrastructure like this, this viaduct that was made uh, uh, everywhere to access with cars. Now we close some of these viaducts. We, we use only a public transport to do that and plant it with trees everywhere where possible so that now you can make bridges from these new boulevards on top of the traffic into uh, the buildings. And all these buildings are covered with different species and lead to a sequence of beauty and where every plant is tested on this potential. It becomes the library of plants in, uh, in Seoul and in Korea. Yes, also in night you want to go there. You want to sit there. And it's beautiful, poetic still, and safe. Uh, hoovering over this amount of traffic below. And, that, and there you want to hang out and celebrate the nights. It's open day and night together. So what happened in that? Is it just to tell you, when this was the starting point, now it starts to look like this. And uh, if I come closer, then it becomes something, but then it gradually turns into this. Where are my plants, is in this case, the situation. It became, you said it should become popular. Well, it is. And actually that helps at this moment to talk with the firemen, with the police, to do a next step in this, imagine, in this growth. So what is next? I can make more bridges, I can make more connections, so that these streets will transform into these connections. And that you gradually have this starting point that becomes gradually now into this pure greenification, this pure, say, pedestrianization of this old, now, what is the 60s town in Korea? And what is then next? I'm very happy, uh, but in the discussions now, a little bit also Trump is helping, between the two leaders in the unification, that this place will be the place where the next train from Vladivostok to, uh, to South Korea will make a halt, maybe because of this popularity now. And it will transform into this new gardens where the train will stop in that way, with, with gar glass from below. It becomes the, the dance garden of uh, South Korea that invites you to come and share with you. I end with Moscow, of course. I'm an editor of Domus this year, and I want to show urbanism. And, I want to, and I'm very happy that Moscow indeed is working uh, a lot on your pavements. This project is a part of this kind of greenification that I would like to make everywhere in the, in the world. And I'm very happy that you do it. Killing some of the cars, getting rid of some of the infrastructure in you, and then plant it simply with trees, I think this will lead to an attraction of your city that will lead to these new economies that I foresee in the, the coming time. Thank you for your attention. Winnie, as an architect and urbanist and uh, urban planner, what is your vision? We are seeing the cities of the future, although we have a glimpse of the cities of the future. How the city will be looking in 30 years? Is this going to be the same, but we'll have more of the things you've shown? Or do you think the city will be drastically different, totally different? I didn't talk today about the, the next step after this slides. And it's true that there will be much more happening in the, in the future. Next lecture, maybe next year, I hope to show you what will happen when our individual mobility or when our sky cars are there in the future and then you have an other city as such. Next time I can show you what, what happens in the case, then all the material here is not a concrete, but the kind of rubber that transforms our buildings as we speak, then our cities will transform even more. 
there's a and yes what happens in the case that everybody can speak what he wants uh, what how will the city will look like like that then that i will show you the next time спасибо спасибо thank you very much thank you winnie uh, dear friends uh, there is no more time and uh, the next question will be the final one. I've asked the very first question to all the panelists and asked them to uh, answer it within 20 or 30 seconds. Now is my final question, since uh, our question is uh, environment for development and the comfortable city is the uh, economic driver. My question is, if we take an average Russian city or a town, not very big, not with a million population and not too small, what advice would you give uh, to the city managers where do they have to begin? Let's say that they've listened to us and they say, okay, we have to transform uh, our city. And we've heard about 36 indicators. What would you advise them? What to begin with? What would be the first steps? Could you please take 20 or 30 seconds? Whoever would like to be first, uh, Vladimir, the floor is yours. Let's go from the right to left, from right to left. Uh, where is your right? Where is my left? Uh, let's make up our mind first. Marat, the floor is yours. I believe that in any city, we have to begin uh, by what uh, people need. We have to understand their needs. We have to understand not simply like an average uh, aggregation of their needs, but in each district and locations. We have to pay more attention to that, and we should invest enough money and, and, and time. Only when we know what people want, by doing this kind of integrated program, only then we can achieve uh, a success in the city. In my opinion, our bottleneck, our professionals, especially architects, let's say if a mayor has come to a city, they have to find a person who will help them to organize, to organize the whole urban economy and all the things related to it. And um, this is our weakest links. We need uh, more professionals who would be able to understand us and give just the right right ideas for the uh, city to, to develop and evolve in a right manner. I would like to disagree because when we speak about um, where the new uh, urban team has to begin with, first you have to build the team, the team of like-minded people and professionals alike. I think it's the step number one in the very first step of such an urban team. Maxim has mentioned about that. You have to make uh, your city cleaner. It's about cleaning up your streets. It's about um, it's about taking out the waste, waste management, which will send right signal. This is the team of people who really want to change something in our place. They are aiming for better. It's not going to take that much money to make the first steps because uh, always local municipalities are saying, "Oh, we're lacking money in our municipality." Yes, this is true. Yes, you're lacking money. And most of the municipalities today have very limited funds. They have very weak funds, I should say, weak budgets. But these very first steps are usually not about even financial resources. It's about intellectual and organizational resource. So we have to focus more on, more on uh, utilizing these resources and at least to uh, make our places cleaner. And this will be the big leap forward by, tr by getting trust of the uh, city residents. Simple steps, uh, but yet they will be able to uh, push you forward. Thank you. Good morning. The leaders of the city think as an obsession how to retain and how to attract the best people. However you define best. We live in a more glo in a globalized world where the best people can live anywhere. So how can you attract and retain the best people? Quality of life has become a tool of economic competitiveness. A second comment is make sure that technology works for people and not people for technology. And the third, if everything you do is great for an eight-year-old and for an 80-year-old, then it's going to be great for everybody. Thank you. Well, I guess it makes sense why we have to work with the Ministry of Construction because uh, Vladimir is uh, the governor and he is he's still a governor and is already a minister. So in terms of the very first steps, we have to um, make our cities cleaner. We have to uh, put things in order. And in terms of strategy, we have to develop a vision. And this vision has to combine, number one, what people want, 
in my location, what are the needs of locals? And secondly, some kind of dream, you know, things we'll look forward to. Maybe it's not there yet today, but it's in the minds of people because not everybody is thinking about, like, what are we going to do 20 or 30 years into the future? We have to engage them in this dialogue, and uh, then we can build some sort of strategy. Thank you. Winnie? Oh, sharing a lot, a lot in common in this, uh, in this uh, session. I would advise uh, a national program, indeed, where every mayor will be supported now to start with a, with a kind of shop in the very middle of its town, which is open day and night, where there's a big model and where uh, you are with talks to specialists, kids, um, investors um, and developers, you are going to make with you, with them, what you want with that city. May show it on that model, fantasize what should be where in that way, and that can lead then, hopefully, already to short-term actions that this model will give to you. I think that would be somehow very illusionary, very visionary, and it would uh, help to illustrate the words that we are sharing today. Спасибо. Итак, дорогие друзья, мы заканчиваем нашу дискуссию. Ну, вот очевидно то, что... You know, do the simple thing and then move forward. I remember an expert on strategy saying once that I've been doing strategy for 50 years and now I understand that we've been doing it all wrong. We used to say strategy comes first and then everything else, but now I understand that we were wrong. We got it wrong. We need to clean our mess and then think of strategies because you can't come up with good strategy. Well, it's a mess. So if you find a team of like-minded people, clean the mess, and then come up with a vision, I'm sure you will succeed. With this, I want to thank all participants of our discussion. And I would suggest that we thank our moderator, who did a great job, as usual.